From Greenland's icy mountains, from India's coral strand, where Afrique's sunny fountains rolled down their golden sand, from many an ancient river, from many a palmy plain, they call us to deliver their land from error's chain. Can we whose souls are lighted with wisdom from on high, can we to men benighted the lamp of life deny? Salvation, O oh salvation, the joyful sound proclaim, till each remotest nation has learned Messiah's name. And on August 15, 1947, the flag of independence flew over emancipated India. Free India, proud India, jubilant India, While the people celebrated, the British withdrew their military forces. Modernity is many things. Urbanization, industrialization, technologization. At its simplest though, it's a project of supposed improvement, science and progress. As a project then, modernity seeks to expand itself. If improvements can be made, they should be made. The natural earth is modernity's garden. No part of Britain is more than a hundred miles from the sea. Every day for hundreds of years, years of peace and years of war, John Britain has seen ships sail from his island to the seven seas. Exploration was at the heart of the modern expansionist drive that began in earnest in the 17th century. But why then? Why not before? What shifts in psychology led to this new attitude in Europe about an unexplored world? We can sometimes see shifts in the most unexpected places. Take this 1658 book, William Percy's The Complete Swimmer. In it, he writes, there are two only chief ends, which are the only inducements to all actions in the whole world, and these are pleasure and profit. Yes, these are the main and only objects whereon all creatures, animal or rational, fix their eyes, the wheels upon with which all our actions turn. For Percy, even when it came to swimming, the motivations were simple, not honour, virtue, achievement, sacrifice, the common good, but pleasure and profit. This was new. In the same year, thousands of miles away, the Taj Mahal had just been completed. A few years before this, the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes had written that all action was in the pursuit of power. Others had started to talk of utility, what's most useful to me, but the shift was towards self-interest. In 1747, Jean-Jacques Berlin wrote that now let man reflect but ever so little on himself, he will soon perceive that everything he does is with a view of happiness. By 1776, Adam Smith could write that it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Since the scientific revolution, it was beginning to be assumed that human nature was calculable, scientific, had simple principles, that people act in rational and predictable ways. Happiness, pleasure, utility, whatever it was, was pursued, stored up, or to use a word that the utilitarian Jeremy Bentham invented in 1817, maximised. For the ancients and the Christians, traditional ideas of human psychology emphasised honour, virtue, restraint, contemplation as things to be pursued for a good life. Until the modern period, when philosophers had asked the question, how is happiness achieved, virtue was almost always part of the answer. 
As modernity approached, a new philosophy began to replace this. Machiavelli had argued that all was power, that we all have insatiable appetites that could be continually fed without limits. For Hobbes, we seek power because it assures us of pleasure. Throughout the 17th century, the word interest becomes increasingly popular. In 1579, interest meant that which is to or for the advantage of anyone. In 1622, it had come to mean the regard to one's own profit and advantage. Importantly, interest and interests have no limit. They can be pursued without hitting a ceiling. As one periodical claimed in 1730, the love of power is natural. It is insatiable, almost constantly wetted and never cloyed by possession. After Hobbes and Machiavelli, many thinkers began to reinterpret morality as strategies for pursuing pleasure and utility, maximising gain and minimising pain, being utilitarian and individualist. John Stuart Mill wrote in the 19th century that pleasure is the only thing desired, therefore pleasure is the only thing desirable. Around 60 years after Machiavelli had published his treatise on power, a ragtag group of merchants gather in London in an old timber building. Many of them were from the middling classes, or of humble origins. Clothiers, leather workers, a couple of soldiers and sailors. The mayor of London was also present. They were there to agree to petition Queen Elizabeth to start a company to trade in the East Indies. The company was something new, a joint stock corporation. Anyone could invest. Such a vast, risky, lengthy and expensive business enterprise would be difficult to pursue on one's own. The company was granted a monopoly on trade in the East for 15 years. They purchased ships, collected gold bullion, iron, tin and cloth to exchange with the locals, and in 1601 set off from the Thames in search of pepper nutmeg, cloves, textiles, indigo and cotton that would fetch a high price back home. The new East India Company began setting up bases in a vast and wealthy subcontinent ruled by a powerful Mughal empire. At the time, India had a fifth of the world's population and was producing a quarter of the globe's manufacturing output. England, by comparison, was producing just 3%. The Mughal capitals were the commercial centres of the world. The empire was rich and powerful, with four million armed men at their command. Delhi was larger than Paris and London combined. One Indian poet wrote that Delhi is not a city but a rose garden. Even its wastelands are more pleasing than an orchard. Shy, beautiful women are the bloom of its bazaars, every corner adorned with greenery and elegant cypress trees. At this time, the Mughal Empire was stable, advanced and conscientious. Above all, it was rich and powerful. One European traveller described the emperor's birthday. It took place in a very large and beautiful square, on the sides flowers and trees. The emperor was laden with diamonds, rubies, pearls and other precious vanities, so great, so glorious. His head, neck, breast, arms, above the elbows, at the wrists, his fingers, each one with at least two or three rings, fettered with chains of diamonds, rubies as great as walnuts, some greater, and pearls such as mine eyes were amazed at. Europeans traded in India with Mughal consent. In 1632, for example, when the emperor discovered that the Portuguese had been building without their permission and trying to convert locals to Christianity, he had them attacked and expelled. 400 Europeans were captured, tortured, and many enslaved. Emperor Aurangzeb said that the English were a company of base, quarrelling people and foul dealers. But colonial trading posts quickly grew. The traders, taking in-demand goods back to Europe, rapidly found wealth. Within 30 years, the population of Bombay had grown to 60,000. Robert Clive was born in a village in Shropshire in England in 1725. 
He had a reputation for being an unruly and violent child and a penchant for fighting at school. His uncle described him as having a temper of fierceness and imperiousness so that he flies out upon every trifling occasion. Despite his nephew's boisterousness, he tried his best to help forward the more valuable qualities of meekness, benevolence and patience in him. When he was a teenager, Clive began running protection rackets around his village. Now levying blackmail on anxious shopkeepers trembling for the security of their windows, now turning his body into a temporary dam across the street gutter to flood the shop of an offending tradesman. Luckily, his well-connected father managed to secure the young man a job as a clerk at the East India Company. And in 1743, at 18 years old, Clive left for India. When Clive was growing up in England, the Mughal Empire was being rocked by a series of succession disputes and growing instability. In 1719 alone, four different emperors occupied the throne. The Marathas, a growing coalition of mainly Hindu princes and aristocrats, attacked the Mughal Empire and destabilised the territory to the east. As the empire shrank and fractured, India entered into a period of instability. Everyone carried weapons, men fought for the highest bidder, states, princes and warlords declared themselves independent. A period of anarchy ensued. It was in this environment that the East India Company began to flourish. Europeans made use of new military tactics and more sophisticated weaponry, unavailable to the natives. Clive despised India. He was homesick. He had no interest in the culture in the languages, in the religion or the philosophy, as many of his fellow Europeans did. He attempted suicide multiple times, but he quickly proved himself an effective fighter, then an innovative military leader. He often attacked in thunderstorms or took advantage of the early morning fog. Thousands of miles away, back in Britain, a shift in power was occurring too. The traditional aristocratic landowners who held power in parliament were being challenged by a growing bourgeoisie. Old money and new money collided. The result was not one beating the other, but an amalgamation of the two, a gentlemanly capitalism where new money played by the rules of an old game. The corridors of power in London merged an elite, privately educated culture with deep ties to the church hierarchy and the military classes, with new money that needed to expand to find new markets to capture and new goods to invest capital in. The square mile of the City of London became a fraternity, a privileged club, a network of contacts. The gentleman class dominated the institutions of government, including, of course, the colonial office. A financial revolution was taking place too. The Bank of England was founded in 1694 so that the government could borrow to improve the naval fleet required to protect merchants. The British government could borrow vast sums of money because of stability at home. A stock exchange and merchant banking system began to develop too. As the economist J.A. Hobson wrote, finance is the governor of the imperial engine. Imperialism became the mode of expansion, the inevitable shape of the pursuit of pleasure, of utility, of profit. Colonialism became a process as the historians P.J. Kane and A.G. Hopkins write, of transmitting impulses from a particular source of energy. In 1757, at the Battle of Plassey, Clive emerged victorious over the Bengal Mughal ruler Siraj Dwala. It was the first time in world history that a stock company had declared war on a prince. Ghulam Hussein Salim, an eminent historian of the time, remarked that the chessboard of time presented a new game. The victory firmly secured the company's dominance in the region. 
that Clive's ambition, aggression, recklessness and self-interest drove the company towards complete domination of the subcontinent. Dominance exempted the English from any local taxes on goods, any import or export duties. After the battle, Clive quickly earned a quarter of a million pounds, around 22 million in today's money, instantly making him one of the wealthiest men in Europe. He was 33 years old. Edmund Burke wrote at the time that it's supposed that the general can realise 1.2 million in cash, bills and jewels, that his lady has a casket of jewels which are estimated at least at 200,000, so that he may, with property, be said to be the richest subject in the Three Kingdoms. Clive purchased an estate in Shropshire, a townhouse in London, then another estate, then a weekend retreat. Rumour had it that his wife's pet ferret had a diamond necklace worth over £2,500. Mia Jafar, the puppet emperor the company had installed on the throne, even presumed that the company's ruler was a single person, a prince or a sovereign back in England, rather than a business. He wrote in a letter that it's my earnest desire to see you, which exceeds myself to your heart, the repository of friendship. The company was granted the rights to tax the 20 million people of Bengal, and now India's richest province would be run from an office in London and employ 20,000 Indian soldiers to protect it. Taking advantage of their dominance, the British proceeded to loot and asset strip. Bengal descended further into anarchy and impoverishment. British merchants spread out across the province, bullying, extorting and stealing from locals. Even money, gold coin, started to be in short supply as much of it was shipped back to Europe. One commentator at the time complained that the morals of this nation, otherwise so worthy of respect, have here become prodigiously depraved, which cannot but cause distress to any decent and thoughtful observer. British soldiers and traders permit themselves all sorts of liberties in the pursuit of private profit or in the hope of impunity. I have seen some so far forget their duty that they beat to death unfortunate Indians to extract money not owed to them. The country lies groaning under the anarchy. Laws have no power of sanction. Morals are corrupt to the ultimate degree. The people groan under a multitude of vexations, all caused by the decay and confusion into which this once great empire has fallen. Mir Kasim, complaining to a company official, wrote that the English forcibly take away the goods and commodities of the merchants for a fourth part of their value, and by way of violence and oppression, they oblige the farmers to give five rupees for goods that are worth but one. Hussein Khan wrote at the time that the English have a custom of coming for a number of years and then going away to pay a visit to their native country without any of them shewing an inclination to fix themselves in this land, and as they join to that custom another one of theirs, which everyone holds as a divine obligation, that of scraping together as much money as they can in this country and carrying these immense sums to the Kingdom of England. So it should not be surprising that these two customs, blended together, should be ever undermining and ruining this country, and should become an eternal bar to it ever flourishing again. It was this plundering, exploiting and negligence that set the scene for one of history's most tragic catastrophes. In 1768, the weak monsoon left India dry, in 1769, no rain fell at all. The mud crusted, then turned to dust. The price of rice steadily rose. In 1770, 70% of the harvest was lost. In the city of Mashidabad alone, 500 were dying on the streets each day. In Calcutta, 76,000 perished in three months. Around a third of the Bengal population died in the 1770 famine. That was 1.2 million people. Bodies floated down rivers. Reports came of people selling their children. 
One writer said that dogs, jackals and vultures and every bird and beast of prey grew fat and unwieldy on the flesh of man. Traditionally, the rulers of India had managed bad harvests with reserve grain systems and public relief measures. Although some company officials helped, there was no widespread or official program of support. Most company men cared little and continued to enforce tax collection, in some cases even hanging those who resisted. One company official wrote that he'd counted 40 dead bodies from his bedroom window in one morning. Besides them, hundreds more, groaning in agony. Outside, the poor cried for help. Baba, Baba, my father, my father. This affliction comes from the hands of your countrymen, and I am come here to die if it pleases God in your presence. I cannot move, do what you will with me. He continued that as the vultures and other birds take out the eyes and intestines, whilst the other animals gnaw at the feet and hands, so that very little of the body remains for the Kutri people to carry to the river. Notwithstanding, they had a very hard time of it. I have observed two of them with a dooley carrying twenty heads, and the remains of the carcasses that had been left by the birds of prey to the river. Back in London, the company share price continued to rise, and the board celebrated by rewarding themselves the largest dividend they'd ever had. In that worst famine year, £100 million worth of goods in today's money was transferred from India to England. The historian Mike Davis writes that the newly constructed railroads, lauded as institutional safeguards against famine, were instead used by merchants to ship grain inventories from outlying drought-stricken districts to central depots for hoarding. In Madras City, overwhelmed by 100,000 drought refugees, famished peasants dropped dead in front of the troops guarding pyramids of imported rice. In short, millions perished as a result of free market economics and imperial mismanagement. While all this was going on, business continued as usual. The relationship between Parliament and the company, a public-private partnership, was crucial. Seats in Parliament, rotten boroughs as they were known, were bought by returned businessmen, and Parliament continued to protect the company. In fact, as the historian William Dalrymple argues, the company probably invented corporate lobbying, bribing officials and buying off figures like the Attorney General. This eventually led to a case against the company. The government eliminated customs duties and tariffs within the burgeoning empire, meaning that powerful merchants could trade without interference, buying cheaply from India and manufacturing cheaply in Britain with advanced techniques and then selling back to other countries. In the 18th century, India had been a net exporter of textiles to Europe, but by the 19th century this had been reversed, as it was importing two-thirds of its textiles from Britain. The local Indian textile industries had been destroyed. Marx had written in the middle of the 19th century that those family communities were based on domestic industry. In that peculiar combination of hand-weaving, hand-spinning and hand-tilling agriculture, which gave them self-supporting power. English interference having placed the spinner in Lancashire and the weaver in Bengal, or sweeping away both Hindu, spinner and weaver, dissolved these small communities by blowing up their economic bases. In fact, there was absolutely no increase in India's per capita income from the Battle of Plassey in 1757 all the way through to independence in 1947. Countries like the US and France had imposed protective import tariffs during the British Industrial Revolution so that they could catch up and copy Britain's technology. India was not allowed this benefit, and while British businessmen built railways and the telegraph systems to transport resources out of the country, countries like Japan and Thailand copied the newly emerging European technologies for their own country's benefits. So, it wasn't the British government, or the British people, that conquered India, but an unregulated, private corporation with profit, power, 
self-interest as their sole motives. Clive was the richest self-made man in Europe, and the company continued to make money in illicit ways, including a booming opium trade forced upon China through warfare. And it would be a mistake to simply assume that these were men of their time. Writer and politician of the time, Horace Walpole, wrote that the famine was caused by the monopoly of the East India Company. A gentleman's magazine article wrote that the company could repeat the same cruelties in this island which have disgraced humanity and deluged with native and innocent blood the plains of India. Down with that rump of unconstitutional power, the East India Company, the imperious company of East India merchants. And in the summer of 1772, the company was a topic of scandal in the London press. Even plays in London took on the subject of the newly rich returning merchants. One thinly disguised satire of Clive included these lines, We cunningly encroach and fortify little by little, till at length we are growing too strong for the natives, and then we turn them out of their lands and take possession of their money and jewels. And don't you think, Mr. Touchett, that it's a little uncivil of us. Oh, nothing at all. These people are little better than Tartars or Turks. No, no, Mr. Touchett, just the reverse. It is they who have caught the Tatars in us. A Scottish historian of the time, Alexander Dow, wrote that the Bengal carcass was almost picked to the bone. He said that in the space of six years, half the great cities of an opulent kingdom were rendered desolate. The most fertile fields in the world laid waste, and five millions of harmless and industrious people were either expelled or destroyed. Want of foresight became more fatal than innate barbarism, and the company's servants found themselves wading through blood and ruin, when their object was only spoil. A barbarous enemy may slay a prostrate foe, but a civilised conqueror can ruin nations without the sword. Monopolies and an exclusive trade joined issue with additional taxations. The unfortunate were deprived of the means, while the demands upon them were, with particular absurdity, increased. We may date the commencement of the decline from the day on which Bengal fell under the dominion of foreigners. Eventually, the company was placed under the supervision of Parliament. A court battle had ensued, and in a speech in his defence, Clive had declared that A great prince was dependent on my pleasure. An opulent city lay at my mercy. Its richest bankers bid against each other for my smiles. I walked through vaults which were thrown open to me alone, piled on either hand with gold and jewels. Mr. Chairman, at this moment I stand astonished by my own moderation. It was cleared, but one MP argued that the government must make some attempt to rescue so many unhappy, industrious natives of the country from the yoke of this government they now live under. In 1774, Clive committed suicide in London. And within 50 years, the East India Company had grown to have an army of 200,000 men, twice the size of the British army, and ruled almost all of India from a boardroom in the financial district of London. By the 1750s, the company accounted for an eighth of Britain's import trade, an empire within an empire, as one of its directors called it, or the grandest society of merchants in the universe as a sign told above its doors. It was the most advanced capitalist organisation to have ever existed, and no company with so much power has existed ever since. In 1830, parliamentarian James Buckingham declared that the idea of consigning over to a joint stock association the political administration of an empire peopled with a hundred million souls was so preposterous that if it were now for the first time proposed, it would be deemed not merely an absurdity, but an insult to the meanest understanding of the realm. And William Dalrymple calls it the supreme act of corporate violence in world history. And one Mughal officer asked, What honour is left to us when we have to take our orders from a handful of traders who have not yet learned to wash their bottoms? On March 12th of 1930, at 6.30am, a slight man, 61 years old, 
clothed in a homespun loincloth, moved against the British Empire. With 79 disciples, he started a 200-mile walk to the sea. Others began to join him. The Viceroy and other statesmen watched with curiosity. Still greater crowds joined him. From all over India they came. Journalists from other countries were flown in to report on this march, this protest, this feeble and farcical protest, this far-reaching and fearsome protest. Hey everyone, I feel very lucky to be able to say that I'm finally at the point where I can commit full time to making these videos. Um, it's a great honour to be able to do that. I absolutely love doing it. I'm going to make two or three videos a month and continue to improve the quality and the research and do a few more experiments and chats and rambles in between. But it is a time consuming job. It's a full time job and it is just me. So unfortunately, right now, Patreon is still the only way that then and now survives. So if you get any value from these videos whatsoever, then please consider pledging a dollar or two dollars on Patreon. If you pledge five dollars or ten dollars or more even, I will add your name to the credits, I will put scripts and the audio and at some point the videos out early for Patreons only. So if there's anything you'd like to see there, then please let me know. But if you can't afford that right now, then of course it's enough to just press like, subscribe, share, and remember to click that bell to be notified to new videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.